hello, Dr. Hi. Rob Anderson with Urgency Room. Glad to have you with us. How, how are you doing? Are you doing well and stay, doing staying well. healthy? And yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank so, you for being able to do an interview this way over the phone and with trying to keep our social, social distancing. That's very kind of you to figure out how to work all this. And it's so important to be talking about this right now. It's yeah. on everyone's mind. Everyone's dealing with it, coping mm -hmm. with this during the COVID-19 crisis. So why don't we begin with at the urgency room, you have three locations. Yep. And why don't you tell us like where should patients be going if they suspect that they might have the virus or if mm -hmm. they do not have the virus, which sure. locations should they be going to and why? Yeah, Jody, it's a good question. So we do have three locations in Woodbury, Badness Heights, and Egan. And we're seeing patients at all three sites. Our hours have varied. Typically, we've been open from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m., but now we're open from noon till 9. But that's constantly changing as the demand um, increases. We may expand those hours. So I'd always refer people to the website. But of our three locations, at our Woodbury site, we're really trying to focus on all respiratory patients going there. So patients with you know, a broken bone or fall off their bicycle and have a bad cut or a scrape, we're trying to encourage those patients to go to our Badness Height location and our Egan location. Um, and if you have any type of respiratory complaint, we'd like people to go to our Woodbury location. We're trying to keep our Badness Heights and our Egan location to be kind of clean sites, so to say, um, without any respiratory illness, because we do know that the coronavirus is so contagious that we're really trying to um, keep those sites clean uh, so that we can um, focus on those patients at our Woodbury site. So who should, you were saying a little bit about who should be going to the Woodbury site or yeah. urgency room. Give us more specifics. I mean, what kind of patients should be going there? So anybody who is concerned that they could have coronavirus and COVID-19 disease or people who have, you know, a cough, um, you know, a runny nose, et cetera, anybody with any type of respiratory complaint, if you went to our Woodbury site, we'd be able to assess you. We have the ability to check a patient's oxygen number, their pulse oximetry, and that's really what we're using as a gauge, along with a patient's respiratory rate to determine who is at risk of having more of a moderate or severe illness uh, with the coronavirus. So anybody with any type of cough, shortness of breath, um, chest pain is a, another symptom of the coronavirus. We're seeing a lot of those patients over at our Woodbury site. You know, I've been hearing a, a number of cases at other parts of the country and even here in Minnesota that some people don't seem to even have any symptoms mm -hmm. and they are testing positive for the virus. Can you, yeah. um, so what do people, you know, if they don't have symptoms, should they yeah. be going to any of these other locations if they suspect, like if they maybe have some risk factors and things like mm -hmm. that? Yeah, you know, it's a very scary thing about this um, disease process. We, we know that there are a lot of asymptomatic people out there. Um, at the end of April, the Minnesota Department of Health and Governor Walls recommended that we try to test more patients who are symptomatic. So prior it had been that we should only test people in certain categories, you know, if you're in a long-term care facility, if you're on dialysis. But now with the governor's recommendation, the Minnesota Department of Health, they said that we should be testing anybody who is symptomatic. So if you have any symptoms of cough, you know, chest pain, shortness of breath, um, we'd be testing those patients. And the Minnesota Department, and when you do testing at the Woodbury um, mm -hmm. Urgency Room, what type of tests do you do specifically? And are they to test yeah. for the virus? Yep, so it's a test for the virus. When we talk about testing, there's two types of tests that people are talking about right now. One is the test to determine if you currently have the infection or not. And that's a test that we're doing. The other test that people refer to is the antibody test. And that's a test to determine if you have had the infection in the past. Your body makes antibodies towards it and then we can detect those through a blood test. And um, that testing is much more limited right now. Um, but of course, with the CDC's recommendation, the White House encouragement to try to um, establish more tests like that, certainly lots of different companies, including the U, the Mail, they're really working on trying to ramp up that testing availability as well. But at the urgency room, we do the test to determine if you currently have the infection or not. And that test, is that the one that we've been hearing where they ha you have to go up very high in the nose to get the yeah. sample and stuff? 
So the initial or it's test just that a came swab out, in the mouth. <laughs> yeah, the, so the initial test that came out, um, they didn't know initially. So they were having us collect a sample, a nasopharyngeal swab. So it's a swab that would go in the nose back around 10 centimeters and a swab in the mouth. But they have changed that testing to be a PCR nasal swab only testing. So for the swab that we're obtaining at the urgency room, um, we have patients kind of blow their nose, um, make sure it's clean. And then we take a swab and just stick it in the nose, maybe one or two centimeters. And it's not nearly as invasive as the original test was that came out uh, back at the end of March, beginning of April. And also we've been hearing, how quickly do you get the results of that test mm -hmm. as well? Yeah, it's a really good question. So it totally varies with more and more companies coming online to be able to do the test. Um, it's all dependent upon these external labs. So, um, you know, back mid-April, it was taking sometimes two to four days to get a test result back. Um, now it can take between one to two days. Um, at the urgency room, we do have the instruments to do the test in-house that takes four minutes to come back, but we don't have the reagent yet. Um, that the company who makes that reagent for our instrument is doing a great job of making the reagent, but it's currently being regulated and we don't have that reagent yet. But as soon as we do, potentially, we would be able to do the testing in-house um, as long as we have the reagent and as long as we also have the appropriate PPE, the uh, protective equipment to keep all of our staff safe as well as we collect the samples. I think people might be surprised too by the numbers of cases I think we have um, of those that have been tested and that mm -hmm. have tested positive about 3,600 or so at, at this time when we're recording this, that um, uh, the largest number are in the ages of 20 to 44 mm -hmm. with 35% of those testing positive. And then also of that, then the next group is like 31%. Mm -hmm. And that's in that 44 to 64 age. And yeah. then of course, the third group that we're seeing here in Minnesota is 65 plus. What are you seeing at the urgency room? Yeah, I mean, certainly people of all ages, um, except for the younger kids, we haven't been seeing um, many positive tests with them. Um, but it really is typically you know, people in their 20s, 30s, um, you know, according to those statistics, that is the majority, but I mean, people in the next age group and the elderly population, I mean, we're still seeing a lot of patients test positive in, in those groups as well. And of those, the younger tend to just get very sick, but can recover from it. And that's yeah. not as serious. Yeah, the it's younger. 65 mm -hmm. plus where it's more, or complicating or um, other other prior conditions like diabetes or heart disease and things like that, that are at a higher risk for yeah, having exactly. various complications. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what you're seeing as well. Yeah. That's what we're seeing at the urgency room. And um, the greatest predictor of who is going to do well um, or who is going to need to come into the hospital or, or be put on a ventilator is based upon the oxygen number, that pulse oximetry. It's just a simple little device that we put on the finger or sometimes the earlobe as well. Um, and we can determine what somebody's oxygen number is. And that's really what kind of gauges who needs supplemental oxygen in the hospital um, or who needs to be put on a ventilator um, and kept in the intensive care unit. And um, that oxygen number um, is something that we have the ability to do. There's also devices sold online um, or at different you know, retail stores as well that you can get and you can actually test your own oxygen number at home. Um, so we've been encouraging people to consider purchasing one of those. They're inexpensive. They cost between $20 to $40. Um, and that's a good gauge to determine um, if you need to be seen, if there is risk of you needing oxygen or needing a ventilator. Um, monitoring your own home oxygen number can be helpful for that. That's a really good tip. Did, did I also hear or, or read about that some maybe with the, their phones that might also be able to tell like some of their their vital sort of their blood mm -hmm. pressure and things like that can also be a detector for the, some people? Yeah, you know, one of the other vital signs um, that you mentioned that we do look at is somebody's respiratory rate. So if somebody is breathing really, really fast, that's a um, very concerning sign as well. So there are a lot of telehealth online platforms that are available now. Um, and just having a conversation through a video chat like we are right now, um, a well-trained provider can determine um, who is breathing really fast, who is talking in very short sentences because they can't catch their breath. Um, and that can help um, indicate who may need to be um, 
evaluated at the urgency room at the hospital who may need to call 911, et cetera, too. And I, I think I'd also read that in some of the other places like Chicago and Detroit, where 70% of their patients that they're seeing testing positive are um, African American or mm -hmm. people of color. Is that what we're seeing here in Minnesota as well, or here in the East Metro? Yeah, so I mean, this is a virus that affects everybody, um, regardless of our race, um, you know, affects people of every color. Um, you know, the one thing that we've noticed with this is that it's not affecting the young uh, for some reason. And we don't know enough about this virus yet to know if it's because kids have already had a lot of different coronaviruses being, you know, in daycare and they have a little bit more immunity or if it just doesn't affect them or maybe the children are more asymptomatic. We honestly just don't know uh, much about it, but we know this virus can affect most everybody um, except for that younger age group. Um, we aren't seeing it as, as much in them. And I'm hearing from a lot of people, we just got over the flu and then mm -hmm. also now we have allergies coming up, mm -hmm. spring allergies. Again, is there something, to, the difference between that and perhaps the co, co, um, COVID-19 virus? Mm -hmm. I mean, the yeah. different symptoms that they're, you're seeing. Yeah, so typically with the seasonal allergies, that's going to be more upper respiratory. So more of the runny nose, maybe some itchy red eyes. Um, but with the coronavirus, it truly is something that affects your lower respiratory tract. So with the coronavirus and COVID-19 disease, it's going to be more of a, a cough, shortness of breath, some chest pain. Um, and ask yourself too, if, if you feel like you're coming down with some seasonal allergies, if every spring you start to get a runny nose, some itchy eyes, um, you feel a little bit stuffed up. If those symptoms are consistent with what you experience year in and year out and there's nothing different, then likely it probably is just seasonal allergies. But if you feel like things are progressing down into your lungs and you're coughing a lot more, you feel more short of breath, and then at that point, we'd be, be certainly concerned about the coronavirus and COVID-19 disease, and I'd recommend being evaluated. And again, we're talking the people at most risk for having complications are those with underlying conditions. And those mm -hmm. conditions, again, would be, what would they be? Like high blood pressure, diabetes, um, people who are in long-term care facilities, you know, needing extra cares for their normal daily routines. We found that those people um, are a little bit higher risk because they do have those underlying, um, you know, other medical problems like the diabetes, high blood pressure, COPD, asthma. Um, people who smoke as well or do vaping, uh, the e-cigarettes, we found that those patients are developing they have a little bit higher risk as well because there's already some damage to their lungs. So, you know, as us healthcare providers, I always try to encourage our patients to quit smoking. This is a great opportunity. You know, there's a lot of stress with being, um, you know, staying at home, not being able to get out, but um, it'd be a great opportunity for somebody to really try to quit smoking. So I plead with you if you're watching right now and, and you smoke, throw them away. You know, as a quick aside, there's a study that came out. It looks at people who smoke and people who try to go on um, a medication to try to help them quit or do a, you know, an e-cigarette or something like that um, versus people who go cold turkey. What we found is people who go cold turkey, stop smoking, um, and all the other groups of people who try some other type of intervention, they all have the same percentage of quitting smoking. So I'd say just go cold turkey. Think about all that money you'll save from not spending them on cigarettes and potentially saving your life as well if you were to get the coronavirus. Um, again, because if you do smoke, uh, vape, e-cigarettes, you're at a little bit higher risk of developing more severe disease. Well, that sounds like really good advice. What about... Um and I've read some reports that people that may be having chest pains or um, heart or even stroke type symptoms mm -hmm. are not going to the urgency room, are not going to the emergency uh, mm -hmm. departments and that. What would you say to these individuals if someone's experiencing these things? Yeah, no, it's a great point. Um, across the entire U.S., um, all my colleagues and other emergency departments, other facilities like ours, we've heard that their volumes have gone down and we really feel that that's uh, a lot of people have fear of going into a facility because they might catch the coronavirus from somebody else. Um, but here in Minnesota, we're, we're doing our absolute best to try to contain all that at another facility that I work at. Um, they've done a great job and all the rooms are negative airflow. Um, at the urgency room, we have really tried to be very intentional about having our sites at Egan and Badness Heights be kind of clean sites, so to speak, um, and really encouraging pa patients with respiratory illnesses not to come to those sites. 
if somebody comes to one of those sites and they have a cough, we'll check their oxygen number and if it's life threatening, we'll call 911 for them. Otherwise, if, it, if they're safe, we'll recommend that they go to our Woodbury site. Um, but yeah, a lot of people are, you know, having chest pain related to a heart attack or they're having new weakness related to a stroke or, you know, um, with a spring being here, a lot of people are outside running around bicycling. Um, we've seen people who have fallen off their bicycle, gotten a, a bad cut and they said, I don't want to go out and get stitches because I might catch the coronavirus. But then they come in five days later because they didn't come in right away and now their wound is just significantly infected and needing drainage and antibiotics so um, we'd certainly encourage people to still come in if you have other concerns um, we're all doing our very best to try to help prevent any infection being um, caught while at our facilities and same with the hospital the hospitals are doing a great job of that as well so it is still as safe as it can be and we'd still encourage people to come in if you're having concerns of you know a heart attack stroke broken bones abdominal pain you know people still get appendicitis and we can still do the ct scan and blood test to determine if they have appendicitis or other you know conditions infected gallbladder so um, please don't ignore your your concerns your medical problems and certainly seek care when appropriate. And specifically if they have those type of injuries or mm -hmm. illnesses to go to your um, the urgency room yeah. in Egan and also in Venice Heights. Those would be yeah. preferred locations to go to. Yeah. You mentioned about um, disinfecting. What advice mm -hmm. do you give to people on how they should be using disinfectants and things like that, whether mm -hmm. at home or when they're out and about or on their yeah. phones? <laughs> Yeah, we're always on our phones, right? No, I'd certainly encourage everybody to wear a mask. Please, if you're going out to the grocery store, I know they can be uncomfortable to wear. I know my wife doesn't like wearing it, but she still does when she goes out to the grocery store if she um, has a necessary errand to run. Um, I do as well. Um, you know, wash your hands. If you're, you know, out shopping, a lot of people are, are trying to wear gloves. But sometimes the gloves, when we're wearing them just out at the grocery store, gives us a false sense of protection. So you're better off wearing the mask um, and then, you know, trying to stay off of your phone uh, when you're grocery shopping, get your groceries. Um, you know, once you get back in your vehicle, use your hand sanitizer when you get home, wash with soap and water. Um, so certainly wear your mask would be my advice. Um, you can wear gloves if you want, but be aware that they can cause a false level of protection because you know, your glove may be touching a dirty surface and then it touches your phone and then you take your glove off, touch your phone again and then rub your eye. And that's one of the ways that you can catch the coronavirus. Um, all these viral illnesses are typically transmitted through your eyes, nose or mouth. So rubbing your eye, picking your nose as well. People who do that, um, uh, you know, if you pick something out of your teeth I and mean, that's how we um, catch these viruses from touching a surface to our face. I was gonna say all great advice, whether we're um, dealing with the pandemic or also just the, yeah. the seasonal flu and things like that. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how this translates if people continue these good habits and things like that in the future. Absolutely. So, um, and, and you know, we've been hearing a lot about the proper hand washing too. Again, mm -hmm. advice on um, people, what is proper hand washing? I know it's good yeah. to hear enough of this advice. Yeah, soap and water for at least 20 seconds, use warm water um, and just do it as, as regularly as you can. Other advice that you would give to our viewers that may be at home watching this and, yeah. and concerned, you know, about this, the virus and, and what they should do and shouldn't do during this time. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, this has impacted everybody, um, you know, and everybody in a different way. There are people who are isolated at home by themselves, haven't been able to see anybody else, haven't been able to give anybody a hug or, or get a hug, you know, in multiple weeks. And there are people who are home with small children, constantly not having any relief. So it affects everybody in a different way. Um, try to remain sane, you know, get out, maybe get some exercise as well. Um, getting some sunshine is very important. Um, really focus on if you do go out grocery shopping or have necessary errands, runs, have a car repaired, um, you know, wear that mask, wash your hands when you come home, have a bottle of the hand sanitizer in your car, uh, maintain that social distancing, it's important. Um, the CDC has said it, in order to catch this, you have to be within six feet. So if you're a foot away from somebody, you're at much higher risk of getting it. So may, try to maintain that six feet of distance um, and still try to enjoy this beautiful spring weather that we have here in Minnesota. 
And, and about the urgency room, for those not familiar with you, that um, you can go online and see how you have shorter waiting lines. You're conveniently mm -hmm. located, located in the East Metro on some of, right yeah. off of some of the main interstates. Why don't you tell us a little, just a little bit briefly about the urgency room? Yeah, so the urgency room is staffed by emergency medicine physicians. Like the yourself. majority of us work half time in the emergency room and then half time um, at the urgency room. Uh, we have a complex lab so we can perform tests for heart attack, the troponin. We can do a test called the D-dimer to determine if you have a blood clot in your lungs. You can do spinal taps. We have a, a CAT scan. We have an ultrasound. We have antibiotics. We have lots of medicines. So we really have the capacity to see a lot of things that can go to the emergency department. We're not an emergency department because we're not open overnight. We don't take ambulances. Um, but we do have the capacity, we have the training um, to be able to take care of a lot of the same conditions that you do in the, in the emergency department, because we are emergency medicine physicians. And again, we're lo located in Woodbury, Badness Heights, and Egan, and we're open. Currently, we're open from noon to nine, but I'd always check our website, um, because with the, this evolving situation, things are continuously changing. And you can also get more information about who we're testing uh, with concern of coronavirus uh, by going to our website at theurgencyroom.com as well. Well, always great to have you on Inside Healthcare. You're always Thank you. great information, and I think it's more important than ever to be hearing from you during this time. So, and you continue to stay safe and healthy, and thank you for thank you, what Judy. you're doing for us and the community at large. So thank you so much. Thank you, my pleasure. Hi, my name is Chris Ayersman, and I'm the Director for Infectious Disease at the Minnesota Department of Health. I know that COVID-19 is on everyone's minds. Slowing the spread of COVID-19 is vital for protecting our communities. Right now, it is important for people to cancel large gatherings and practice social distancing. And what this means is making sure that you're maintaining a distance of about six feet between people. Continue washing your hands, covering your cough, and cleaning frequently touched surfaces. Stay home when you're sick. I'll say that again, stay home when you're sick. That is the most important thing. We know these recommendations mean disruption to your lives, but they are so important. We need to slow the spread of the virus so that we don't overwhelm our hospitals and clinics. Thank you for doing your part. If we work together, we can manage this situation. May is the prime time for injuries, and we've come to the urgency room in Egan to talk with Dr. Rob Anderson about the injuries that they're seeing and what we can do to prevent them. So what are the most common injuries, and mm -hmm. glad to have you back yeah. with us. Yeah. Um, what are the most common injuries that you see in the springtime in particular? You know, everybody's so excited to finally be outside again. You know, April has passed us. All those April snowy winters that we've had in years past are now gone. And, really we don't get snow in in may and everyone's outside eager to be outside whether it's running biking just playing soccer outside again people are just so excited to be out there we see a lot of sports related injuries from people twisting their ankle running playing soccer again outside being on a more muddy field with a snow melt out there um, or even biking injuries you know minnesota is such a great state for biking and people love to go out biking and they're eager to get out there they haven't been out all winter typically and all of a sudden they're going fast down a hill and they fall off their bike they're not used to it and just getting that coordination again um, so those are some of the common uh, mechanisms for injuries that we see here in the urgency room and and um, what are the type of injuries that you do see then so a lot of concussions imagine all the people biking mm -hmm. out there especially with the mountain biking you know a lot of people are wearing helmets i'd say most people do obviously we always encourage people to wear your helmets um, but even falling off of your bike with a helmet on it with a significant head injury like that when people are at risk of concussions or sometimes even worse yet if you're going fast enough down a hill people even have bleeding in their brain from a significant head injury so we have a set of criteria that we use um, that all providers use to determine who is at even a little bit of risk of bleeding in their brain. And you know, if somebody does have a head injury from falling off their bike, we have the ability to kind of go through that criteria. And if somebody falls into the criteria warranting imaging, we can do that CAT scan right here to quickly determine if you have any bleeding in your brain from a head injury. So that's one of the more common ones that mm -hmm. we see are concussions, sprained ankles a lot as well. And then just, you know, the, the falls and the scrapes on the knees. I have three young kids and every, I mean, in the winter they're getting out, but especially in the spring, they just want to be outside all the time. And they're falling down on the ground, scraping their knees and, you know, notable abrasions that need to be cleaned out so we can put a topical numbing medicine on the, 
medicine on that and then clean it out really and well. keep it dry then after yeah, that keep then. it dry and make sure people's tetanus is up to date we have the ability to check that and provide those here too how can um the, how can a mom or a parent can they tell like if their child has a sprain or mm -hmm. a broken bone mm -hmm. in particular yeah it's a very mm -hmm. common question that we are asked here and is, is it broken yeah you know typically if you if you can't move something if you can't walk on it that's a sign that there probably is something broken if you can easily walk on an extremity. I'm not saying there's nothing broken, but the likelihood of there being something broken is much lower. Um, but still, there, the possibility is there. So ultimately, we end up doing x-rays a lot to determine if something is broken. And x-rays, for the most part, can pick up most fractures. Sometimes there can even be tiny little broken bones that we can't see on an x-ray. Oh. Um, so we always recommend close follow-up in a week if the pain is still there, if things are getting worse, to get another x-ray or see a specialist. And they can come to the urgency room for all of that care? Yep, then? so we can do those x-rays here, and we can do a CAT scan if needed. You know, some injuries are ligamentous injuries that need an MRI, and we don't have MRI capacity here but we do have the CAT scan and x-rays and ultrasounds. Yeah. Um, what advice or tip would you give um, to maybe prevent injuries? Something as simple as like making, say, making sure they're, uh, they're well hydrated mm -hmm. or um, they have protection from the sun and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah so if you're sending your kids out to play soccer again you know in the springtime wearing the sunscreen is important staying hydrated you know oftentimes it's a springtime we're excited to be outside and just being outside running around so much we forget that we need to be drinking a lot more water and sometimes people can get kind of lightheaded and get dehydrated and pass out and they can end up with a second injury you know you can twist your ankle and then pass out hit your head I mean these are common things that we see here um, that we can address. What would be some of those other signs or symptoms that they are dehydrated mm -hmm. and they need some fluids in them? Yeah I mean just feeling lightheaded especially if you're running around you start to see spots in your vision and you feel like you might pass out I mean, those are common things that we can feel when we're actually really too dehydrated and you should be coming in sooner. Just feeling very parched in your mouth as well. If you haven't urinated for quite a while too, that's a sign that you could be dehydrated. And or if the urine's dark? Yep, if it's really dark and concentrated, it has a bit of an odor to it, that's a sign oh. that it could be um, more concentrated urine, a sign of dehydration. Okay, and then other um, advice for parents on preventing these injuries? Mm -hmm. Please make sure your kids wear your <laughs> helmets all the time. I always tell my kids before you get on their scooter, their bicycle, they have to have their helmet on. I don't want them to fall and hit their head and, you know, maybe they suffer concussion, but they could also get a little cut on their head just from the impact that can split the skin open. And you have to put a topical numbing medicine on there, some uh, anesthetic, and then put some stitches or staples in there. And mm -hmm. that can be traumatizing for kids. So please wear your helmet. All right. Yeah. Any Final comments. And yeah, well, we'd be happy to see anybody. If you ever have any concerns, we're open in Egan, Vadness Heights, and Woodbury from 8 a.m. till 10 p.m. every single day of the year. We'd be happy to see you. Dr. Rob Anderson, always a pleasure to have you on. Thank you, Jody. Thank Thanks. you for being here.